have your Bibles, we're going to be in John 17 as we continue this journey that Jesus is on that leads us to Easter Sunday to the empty tomb. We're on this journey with him to the empty tomb. This is the third week of this series. The first week we started with Jesus making the pronouncement. This was what we would know as the Palm Sunday text. Jesus makes this triumphant entry into Jerusalem on this donkey with the people crying out Hosanna and laying the palms down. But it, it began, right, this, it was a catalyst for what would occur in the next couple of days in that week that ultimately would lead to Jesus dying on Calvary's cross and then leaving that tomb three days later as the perfect sacrifice, the final sac- Passover sacrifice for all of our sins and allowing us through him to never experience death, that he defeated death when he walked out of that tomb. And last week we found ourselves in the upper room and Jesus was there. And before this dinner that they were gonna have, Jesus washed their feet and we talked about what that meant, the significance of what Jesus did and in that moment and then what it means still for us today and what Jesus has done for us. And in, in the forgiveness of sins, not only that, but in the cleansing of removing the sins that only he can do. And today, we're still there in the upper room, but we're gonna look at this prayer that Jesus prays. It's the longest prayer recorded by Jesus. I think when, when we consider the events of Easter, we easily go to the Garden of Gethsemane and Jesus prays there because we talk about this prayer where Jesus is there and he's you know, sweating so bad, it's either drops of blood or, or you know, the, but he's under this, this anguish of the weight of what was happening and, and he prays that if, if God could take the cup, But then he says, but your will be done, that he would accept what was coming. But he prayed another prayer before they get there. So Jesus washes their feet at that dinner. They eat. Jesus, during that meal, identifies Judas as the betrayer. He gets up and leaves. Peter and Jesus have another conversation. And Jesus tells Peter that he would deny him three times before that night was over, before the rooster would crow right after Peter just said that he would die for Jesus. He would die for him. Jesus said, you, that won't happen because you won't even admit that you know me through this night. And Jesus tells him not to be troubled. And then he gives this farewell discourse as we know it. He, he kind of gives them all this truth in the next couple of chapters in 15 and 16 or 13, uh, 14, 15 and 16. Jesus is giving them this truth, kind of like this final family meeting with his disciples, Jesus knew what was coming. They don't, they don't know yet exactly how this is gonna unfold. They don't know what's coming. But Jesus gives them all this truth that we could spend months in. And then when he was done, he prayed. And he prayed, as John records it, in front of them. He allowed them to experience his prayer in that time and in that moment. And if I just go back to to uh, the end of chapter 16, leading up to this prayer, Jesus gives them all this truth, does all this great teaching. And then in verse 29, it says, then his disciples said, at last you are speaking plainly and not figuratively. Now we understand that you know everything. There's no need to question you. From this, we believe that you came from God. Now, that to me is very interesting because you think for three years, these guys have traveled with Jesus. They were, they were his entourage. As close as anybody could get to Jesus, it was them. They were front row seats to the feeding of 5,000 when he multiplied that little boy's lunch and fed 5,000 men and their families. He, they watched Jesus heal lepers. They watched Jesus heal a lame person. They watched Jesus heal the blind. They watched Jesus exercise a demon. They watched Jesus walk on water. They watched Peter get out of the boat and walk to the, on the water to Jesus. But it was after this teaching that they said, from this we believe. All that they had seen, and I just say that because I think sometimes we still struggle with understanding. And so it will come. Just stay close to Jesus. You'll get it. We're all learning. And then Jesus asks them this in verse 31. Do you finally believe? But the time is coming, indeed it's here now, when you will be scattered, each one going his own way, leaving me alone. Yet I'm not alone because the Father is with me. I've told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart because I have overcome 
the world. Jesus knew what the next couple of days and weeks and months were going to look like for these men. And he's preparing them for this. And then verse, seven, or verse 1 of chapter 17. After saying all these things, Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son so he can give glory back to you. For you have given him authority over everyone. He gives eternal life to each one you have given him. And this is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work you gave me to do. Now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Let me pray. Father, as we open up your word, may we hear from you. May we go through the uncomfortable process of feeling conviction. May we be encouraged that you're not done with us, that you're wanting us to look more like Jesus. So help us to hear you and then to follow you. So I ask for faithfulness and strength for each of us. Thank you for loving us enough to send your son to die in our place. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. I read, if you really want to know somebody, pray with them. Because in our prayers, we become transparent. Our prayers tell us a lot about who we are, what we think of ourselves, and who God is, what we think of God. That will come out in our prayer. And Jesus gives us this long prayer we just started, and we're going to take a macro view of this. There's a lot to unpack in here. But I think he's got something to teach us about praying as a response, because this is what Jesus is doing. He, he knows what's coming, and he goes to God. And I think oftentimes it's our first, maybe near the top of the list, if not the first, to go to God when we're experiencing something where we feel like we, we need some help. And we go to God. Maybe we just really value the relationship like we should with him, and we just want to have communion with him, so we just have conversations with him. But this is what prayer is. And Jesus is going to show us uh, kind of this, this structure to prayer that I hope helps you. It challenged me all week, and will continue to. So you may experience that as well. But if I go to just the first couple of words of verse 17, John records that Jesus looked up to heaven and said, Father. This tells us something about prayer. First, it tells us that there's a posture to prayer. In this time and in this place, the posture was to look to heaven, oftentimes to spread their arms out and to look to heaven. But there was a physical posture to prayer. Our physical posture to prayer now would be to Close our eyes and bow our heads, fold our hands, right? How we got from arms out, looking to heaven to hear, my guess is that a mother with children at some point in, in the timeline told her kids, close your eyes, bow your head, and fold your hands. And we've adapted that as a posture of prayer, a physical posture of prayer. I make a joke about it, but really it helps us. If you're like me, I, I, I'm all over. My mind never stops. So I, if I don't close my eyes, then I'm not paying attention. So I have to close my eyes. But it's this, it's this physical posture of prayer that we take. And corporately, it's probably different. In here, I often ask, we ask, I often ask to stand when we pray. But when I'm alone, I don't stand when I pray normally. Oftentimes I find myself on my knees in my office praying. But we take different postures when we pray. But there's a physical posture. There's also a, a spiritual, this, this, this figurative posture to prayer. Jesus looks up to heaven. This is what we do, right? We're reaching out and up to God. Why do we go to him with anything? Well, because we believe he's greater than we are. And he can do what we cannot and no one else can. So we go to him. Now, let me tell you something. There, there's going to be some talk in this text that, that I'm going to bring out that's going to make you maybe not feel so good. I didn't feel real good all week studying this text because it really challenged. I'll just give it to you. Our prayers oftentimes are just selfish. 
that we pray for things so that we feel better. That I give God my problems so he'll just solve them. So things are easier for me. That I can just be happy. That this pain can go away. This problem will, will not exist. It's, it, it can be very selfish. And Jesus is going to show us that there's a posture, a physical and spiritual posture we take of submission. That we are, we are broken human beings, us, in need of a holy, righteous God to work on our behalf. And that's how we should approach prayer. And then he calls him father, which tells us that there's a person. Like We'll study in the Sermon on the Mount. We'll get to the, the Lord's Prayer. And, and how does it start? Our father, which art in heaven, right? A person and a place is where the prayer starts when Jesus is teaching. And here in this intimate prayer with this group, with the weight of the events that are just about to happen, Jesus calls out to God. He calls him father. This relationship that not only does he share and have with, with God, but that we have, that he's our heavenly father, that he sees us as children. There's a rank there, right? We're, we're, we're not equals. Just like a child is not an equal to their parent. There's authority there. And there's submission of the child to the parent. And when we approach prayer, we need to remember that we're praying to a a holy, righteous God who is our heavenly father. He's the only one we should be praying to. There's no other reason. There's really no reason to pray to uh, any, any saint or any other person on our behalf. Jesus made the way to God for us. He's the only one we need. We have access to the father. And to go apart from Jesus, to feel like we have to pray to some saint, really, in my mind, says that those people, whoever they are, we could name a lot of them, that people pray to, can do something that Jesus cannot. And then we challenge the authority of the Son. But Jesus was clear that he was the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by him. He's the only way. So he affords us, he allows us to have access to God. Now he's going to make some petitions because this is what we do in prayer. We ask God for things. What Jesus is going to show us, though, in this text is, is, is not that we can't ask for things, that we, we just can't, you know, it's forbidden. It's not. That we can come to God with, with our petitions. God wants to know what's bothering us, what's hurting us, where we need help, what are we struggling with. But Jesus gives the, a why to the what, we come to God and go, God, here is what I need, and we give him our list. Jesus gives God this list of what, but he follows each of them up with a why. He gives God a reason to answer it, and the reasons aren't selfish. They're not focused on him. They're focused back on God. Think about your child comes up, if you have a child, and they want money, right? When they're little, it might be a dollar or two. As they get older, it gets more expensive, right? Dad, can I get $20? What's the first question? Why? I have the $20 to give you. What do you need it for? Is the reason good enough for me to respond to your request in the way you're asking? And I think God is the same way. He can do anything for us. I think he's interested in the why. Why do we want what we want? Because I think the request can be the same if we just look at it through his eyes. And, and this will unfold a little bit if that sounds confusing right now. But I think we can have the same heart, we can pray for the same things, but look at it from a different perspective and see how God might use those things to draw us closer to him. So here Jesus in these first five verses of this prayer is focused on glory. He repeats this multiple times in this first couple of sentences. Glorify your son. That's a request. God, Father, glorify your son. Why? So he can give glory back to you. God, give me your glory. Exalt me. Lift me up so I can just be a mirror to reflect it back. Jesus doesn't want to look good. He wants God to look good. And then he says, he gives eternal life to each one you've given him. That Jesus has been given this authority. 
He's saying this in front of his disciples that, and he'll repeat this, that God gave him and God gave him and God gave him, that God is the source, even to Jesus, that, that what they shared, Jesus was showing them that it's, it's all coming from him. And he gives eternal life. If there was a question of how do we get it, Jesus explains it in one sentence. This is the way to have eternal life, to know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, the one you sent to earth. Not to know about him. We know a lot about people that we don't know, right? We, we know a lot about our president. We know a lot about our former president. Anybody know him? But we know a lot about him. Knowing about God and knowing about Jesus is not the same as knowing them. And knowing them, having the right relationship with them, is how we're afforded eternal life. And he says, I brought, you, I brought glory to you here on earth. How did Jesus bring glory to God on earth? By completing the work you gave me to do. That God is glorified by our faithful obedience to his work that he's entrusting us to do to advance his kingdom, to share the message. And he says, now, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. Because remember, Jesus gave up this glory to come to planet Earth and die a criminal's death on a cross for us. So he starts his prayer with, 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 with glory, that he's asking for things, but those things that he's asking for bring God glory. His motivation is for these things to happen so that God gets glorified. And then in verse 6 through 19, we see this, this kind of second section of the prayer. And here he's going to pray for the disciples, the men who are sitting at the table, who are listening to this prayer. He says this, I have revealed to you, to the ones you gave me from this world. I have revealed you to them. They were always yours. You gave them to me and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything I have is a gift from you. For I've passed on to them the message you gave me. They accept it and know that I came from you and they believe you sent me. My prayer is not for the world, but for those you have given me because they belong to you. All who are mine belong to you and you have given them to me. So they bring me glory. Now I'm departing from this world. They are staying in this world, but I'm coming to you. Holy Father, you have given me your name. Now protect them by the power of your name so that they will be united just as we are. During the time I protected them by the power of the name you gave me, I guarded them so that no one was lost, except the one headed for destruction, as the scriptures foretold. Now I'm coming to you. I told them many things while I was with them in this world, so they would be filled with my joy. I've given them your word, and the world hates them because they do not belong to the world, just as I do not belong to the world. I'm not asking you to take them out of the world, that's the request. I'm not asking you to take them out, but to keep them safe from the evil one. They do not belong to this world any more than I do. Make them holy by your truth. Teach them your word, which is truth. Just as you sent me into the world, I'm sending them into the world. And I give myself as a holy sacrifice for them so they can be made holy by your truth. What is he praying for, for these men whose lives are about to be completely flipped upside down? They're not aware of what's gonna happen. And Jesus is praying for them. He's praying for their sanctification. He's praying that God would make them holy. That's what he's praying for. Why would he pray for God to make them holy? Because they need to be holy to be sent with the message that God gave them. It's not bad to pray for somebody, to pray for our kids, say, God, draw them to you. But what, what is the reason we want God to do that? Is it to advance his work? Is it to carry his message? Or is it just so we don't have bad kids, so we don't have problems at school with them and they're not talking back and what's the motivation to the request? Jesus was concerned first with glory, that his life would bring glory. If I took, a, if I said, hey, let's raise hands. Who wants to live? Who, who's committed to living for the glory of God? I would think every hand would go up. 
What Jesus showed us where hands may come down is he was willing to bring glory to God through his death as well. And we're committed to living for the glory of God, but are we committed enough to die for it? Because we could tell stories of of the heroes of the faith who died for their faith, who stayed faithful to the end and died because the world hated them, because of Jesus. So he's praying that, that God would strengthen these guys because they're, they're it. He's going to die, rise again, and go to heaven. These 11 guys have to take this message and share it so that it will multiply, so that more people will hear, that this will continue. So he prays this prayer for them. He says, you sent me. I'm not staying here. I need you to keep them safe from the evil one, not safe physically from problems, from harm. People die for their faith. They're persecuted for their faith. He's saying, I want you to protect them from the evil one. I don't want him to get in their ear like he did with Eve in the garden and buy his lie and walk away from you and create dysfunction in this relationship. Break it. I don't want them to hear the lies from the enemy that what the world has to offer is greater, that their dreams are better, that their plans are are, are more significant than anything you could offer, and they walk away from you, rejecting your son. Protect them from the evil one. May they stay faithful to you. And then, then he says, make them holy. Teach them your word. I'm sending them into the world. The mission for them is to put them out there where they hate us. But the mission is to go there. So I need them to be safe from the evil one and I need them to be strong spiritually. I need their faith to be strong. So you have to continue to give them your truth. You have to continue to reinforce this, who you are, that they look more like Jesus and less like themselves every day. That's the same call that you and I have that God can use us if we let him change us. Jesus makes this prayer for sanctification of the disciples. Then he continues in verse 20, and he prays for us. I'm praying not only for these disciples, but also for all who will ever believe in me through their message. If we've put our faith in Jesus, if we've crossed that line of faith, and we we put our, our, our eternity right, in his hands, trusting that he is the Messiah, it's because the disciples did what they were supposed to do, that they went and told people. And those people put their faith in Jesus and they went and told people. And those people put their faith in Jesus and they told people. And it was this, this, this plan, this church planting plan that we could go back and look at through the book of Acts and, and under the persecution that surrounded Jesus, people scattered And now the message of the good news of Jesus is going all over the place, that even God could use that to spread his word. And at some point, it got over here, and then you and I got to hear it. Somebody shared it with somebody who shared it with somebody, and that list went on until it hit you and I. And then we either believed it or rejected it. But if we believed it, then we have a call to share it. And then he says, I pray that they will all be one, just as you and I are one. As you are in me, Father, and I am in you, and may they be in us, so that the world will believe you sent me. Think about the unity of the Trinity. It's beyond what our human minds can grasp, the whole Trinity thing. So I won't try to explain it, because I don't think I can. But that's some serious unity, right? That God, the Father, the Holy Spirit are one, three in one. And he says, I want them, everybody who believes, I want them to have the same unity that you and I share. I want them to experience that type of unity. That's, that's strong unity. And why does he want us to experience the unity? So, so we can hang out, so we can have cookouts and holidays and birthdays together, so we could just be best friends, so we could just do life together and enjoy it, which is a good thing, right? That's... That's not where Jesus was going. He said, so that the world will believe you sent me. 
what, what the world is watching to see if Jesus is real. They're not listening to us. They don't want to hear our words. They want to see how we interact. How good are we at staying together when we're just a bunch of broken human beings that are kind of bound together by Jesus? How committed are we? It's that commitment that shows them that Jesus is real and that God loves them. It's that type of unity that he's praying for. In verse 22, he says, I've given them the glory you gave me so that they may be one as we are one. I am in them and you are in me. May they experience such perfect unity that the world will know that you sent me and that you love them as much as you love me. That's, that's deep love. Then he says, Father, I want those whom you've given to me to be with me where I am. Then they can all see the glory you gave me because you loved me even before the world began. Oh, righteous Father, the world doesn't know you, but I do. And these disciples know you sent me. I've revealed you to them and I will continue to do so. Then your love for me will be in them and I will be in them. Jesus prays for unity. This is what he's praying. This is where he ends his prayer with these disciples. He starts with glory. He moves to sanctification that they would be made holy because they're being sent. They're getting the message. And that everybody who comes after them, the fruit of their work, that there would be unity. And then he makes this request in verse 24. I want these whom you've given me to be with me where I am, which could almost be a selfish request. Like, I, I love them so much, Father, these people you've given me. I just want them to be with me in glory with you. I just want them to come so we can just spend eternity enjoying each other's fellowship and company. That's not the reason that he asks. I want these whom you've given me to be with me where I am. Then they can see all the glory you gave me. I want them to see the glory of the Father in the Son, and they can't experience the fullness of that unless they're here. So let's bring them here. That's the request. That not only will we get to experience God now, but that we get to experience his fullness forever there for eternity. And that we would get to experience the unity of the Father and of the Son and their love now, and that be the glue that binds us together. And that carries the message to the world. So I'm studying this week, preparing for this, and I am challenged by my prayer life. Because I'm thinking, I don't know if I, if I have a prayer that doesn't sound selfish at this point. Because I pray that, that God would protect my boys. I pray that he would protect their minds. I, I, want, I want him to protect their, their, them from pornography. I want, them, I want them to be sexually pure. But what's my reason? Because I don't want them to experience the pain of what comes when they don't. That's not a bad reason. But I read this text and I think, I should be praying that God would protect them from sin that God would protect them from pornography, that God would protect those boys from, from, from being sexually impure so that he could use their lives and their marriages, if that's what God's got planned for them, to show how good he is. What if everything we looked at was kingdom-minded? Is it bad to pray that God heals this person? No. But what could God do with them if he healed them? Maybe we just don't pray that God would heal somebody so they could be back in our life. Maybe we pray that God would heal somebody because we got work to do and they can be a part of that. That they can help carry the message. That God can make and change them even more. What if we prayed that God didn't just give us a new job because we need you know, uh, employment right now or we just, we just need God to fix our fire? What if we pray, God... If, if, I, if I had a better job and could make, I could be more generous. I could help the people who've helped me when they need it. What if everything was kingdom-minded in our requests? What if we sought first our requests and said, how does this bring glory to God? 
How can God use this painful, troubling situation that I'm in that I just want God to change to bring him glory through me? How does this situation that I want to end, I want it to change, I want it to go away, how can God use this not only to bring me him glory through me, but how can he use this to make me holier? How can he use this to change me? It, it doesn't change the request. It changes the outlook on where it's going. It, it makes it much broader. What if the request wasn't just to fix this, to stop this, to, to bring this, and it was, God, it, if, if this could happen, then we, then we could be even stronger together. This will draw me closer to you and closer to these people, your, your people, your children. What if our prayers shifted to that? What could God do? Here, the disciples are hearing this recorded prayer firsthand. We know what's coming for them. They don't know it yet. But I'm guessing when, when he says to them, let your hearts not be troubled. Don't be troubled. I have overcome the world. These words are going to ring in their ears when there's trouble everywhere. When they're experiencing sorrow and confusion and doubt and worry and anxiety as their world is collapsing around them because their leader just died on a cross. And are they going to remember these words of the prayer? That Jesus was going to his fullness of glory and he wants us to be there with him. But he's got to work. This message has to continue to be sent. And how can we take our petitions to the right person with the right posture so that we can be kingdom-minded in everything and watch God do what only God can do? And trust him that no matter the outcome, whether it's the desired outcome or not, it's for his work. His ways are not our ways. His thoughts are not our thoughts. We won't understand it all, but we just have to trust. And the more we pray to him, the more we trust him. The more open we become with him, right? The more we see of him. Jesus shows some real transparency in this prayer in front of those 11 men. And he showed communion with the Father. That there was a real relationship there. God wasn't some cosmic Santa Claus that we just keep uploading our wish list to. But there was depth to this. There was love and unity there. The same love and unity that he desires with you. Do we see prayers building that? leading us closer to him and closer to each other. I pray that a lot. It's not a catchphrase. I want God to draw us closer to him because the more we get near him, the closer we get to each other. And there's unity there because that unity is built on him and not on us and not on our likes and dislikes. So we move to a physical time of communion, which happened in that upper room. On the night, Paul records, Jesus was betrayed that night. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, I pass on to you what I received from the Lord himself. On the night when he was betrayed, the Lord Jesus took some bread he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it into pieces and said, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let me give thanks and then we'll partake. Father, thank you for sending Jesus. Jesus, thank you for being the perfect sacrifice for our sins. May we consider now what you went through for us, how much you loved us. May you draw us closer to you. Let's take the bread together. In the same way, he took the cup of wine after supper saying, this cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood. Do this in remembrance of me as often as you drink it. For every time you eat this bread and you drink this cup, you're announcing the Lord's death until he comes again. Let me pray again. Father, we thank you for the spilled blood of Jesus that he willingly 
went to the cross, knowing what he would endure, the physical pain, the physical death. God, but that he took our sin. And he buried it. That we could be made right with you. That we could have this relationship with you. That we can come directly to you. That you want to hear from us. That you want to know where we're hurting, where we're struggling. But God, continue to teach us your truth. Make us holy that we would look at things from your perspective, the big picture, your mission, to help more people hear the good news of Jesus. And that they too would come to you and put their faith in your son. Thank you for loving us enough to send them. It's in his name that I pray. Amen.